Welcome to Part C, Energy Transfer in an Ecosystem. We've been working on this a little bit in class, so it should mostly be a review. Also, middle school covered a lot of this, so if it seems familiar, that's awesome. So the ultimate source of all energy on Earth is the sun. Shines down on us, it's all happy, and we hope it never goes away. So the sun shines down and it helps our producers capture energy. They take that energy and they turn it into some nice little molecules such as glucose that are chock full of energy. So if you look at that glucose molecule from a molecular standpoint, you're going to see lots of bonds and bonds mean energy. Another name that you'll see used for producers is autotroph. If we break down the word itself, auto means self and troph means food or eater, uh, depending upon who you talk to. So it's like self food or self eater. Plants can take care of themselves. They're out there, they're growing, they're happy dandy and just fine. And so our plants, our blue green bacteria, our algaes, anything with a chloroplast is usually considered a producer. Um, the exception to that would be are um, producers that live in the bottom of the ocean that take on like the thermal vents and their sulfur and stuff but that's kind of an exception our second level are the consumers and that's where we are consumers cannot make their own food and we have to eat another name for consumers is a heterotroph so using the same ones before hetero means other troph means food or either so or eater so you have to eat other things in order to survive so animals amoebas some of your basic protists all that there are three main types of uh, consumers. We have carnivores, which eat meat only, omnivores, which eat meat and plants, and herbivores, which eat plants only. Which one are we? Well, some of us are omnivores. Actually, most humans are omnivores, although we do have some humans who are herbivores, and there are even a few humans who like to think of themselves as just being carnivores. But, you know, whichever you are, most likely you're probably an omnivore. So there are different trophic levels that represent the different levels of energy transfer. Um, we start down at the bottom with our producers. Producers are eaten by primary consumers, who are eaten by secondary consumers, who are eaten by tertiary consumers, who are eaten by quaternary consumers. Now, you'll see here we have actually five levels. We don't go any higher than this typically. Um, basically, we, we don't have enough energy, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. So let's take a look right here. Can you identify how many levels are shown in the chain above and which level each one is? Pause the video for a second and see if you can answer. Click play when you're ready. Welcome back. So let's see. What would you th say? Algae, which one is that? Hopefully you listed that as a producer. Zooplankton as our primary consumer. Mackerel as a secondary consumer. Squid as a tertiary consumer. And shark as our quaternary consumer. All in all, we have five trophic levels in this food chain. One thing that we leave out here, though, are the decomposers or detritivores. These are the organisms that break down dead organic matter as a food source, help recycle nutrients throughout the ecosystem. They are absolutely essential. And so we need them to take those uh, dead creatures and break them down so we can use them again. Otherwise, we just have a planet full of dead stuff and nowhere to go, and there'd be no other food or anything like that. So they are essential, and they get left out a lot. So imagine that we put them up here it could actually go anywhere anytime one of these dies it breaks it down and it'll actually give those nutrients to our producers who will reincorporate them back into the system that's considered a cycle in this fact it would probably be a carbon cycle or a nitrogen cycle and we'll talk about those later so food chains versus food webs which is a better method for showing the energy transfer relationships in an ecosystem and why so if we take a look at these pictures, you know, we've got this one little order. We go from grass to grasshopper to shark to hawk to fungi and back to grass again. And so while that's all good and dandy, what happens if we have a virus that wipes out all the snakes? Well, if we have no more snakes, then we'll have no more hawks. And then there'll be no dead hawks or dead organisms to break down and we could go back to grass um, it would just be awful the other problem we would have here too is that without the snakes to eat the grasshoppers the grasshoppers would grow out of control and then we'd be covered with grasshoppers who would eat all the grass and then we'd be left with again a bare planet and so we 
you know, we'll study food chains, but more than likely, we're going to deal with food webs. And so food webs are much more complicated. If something gets knocked out, we've got other things to back us up, and uh, we can stay a lot more stable in our ecosystem. So let's see if you're good at identifying these. Take a look at the picture, A and B. Which one is the food chain? Which one is the food web? Hopefully you said A is the food web and B is the food chain. How about this one? Well, C should be your food chain, D is your food web. If you haven't figured it out yet, if it's got more arrows, it's probably a web. All right, here we go, E and F. E being our food web, F our food chain. So let's take a look at this one and do a little bit of practice. If you want to pause it and come back in a second, that'd be cool. So A, which organism is a producer? Well, which one is these that can photosynthesize? Hopefully you picked out grass is our producer. Our primary consumers are the organisms that eat the grass. In this case, we have two, the mouse and the cricket. Which organism is both a secondary and a tertiary consumer? Well, secondary consumers are those that eat primary consumers. And so if we want to identify those, our primary consumers are our lizard snake. But if we look up here at our hawk, our hawk eats some primary consumers as well, so he'd be considered secondary. Now, snake is secondary, and he's eaten by the hawk, which is tertiary. And so in this case, since the hawk eats both a secondary and a tertiary, secondary here and primary here, then he can be considered both secondary and tertiary. I think I misspoke there, ignore everything. So, um, Which does the snake eat? The snake eats both the cricket and the mouse. You can see the arrow pointing to it, that means it's going into his belly, so he's got two things. Which organism would be the most affected by the extinction of the cricket? Well, if we take a look here, the cricket is eaten by both the lizard and the snake. The snake, however, also eats mice. So if we wiped out all the crickets, the snake would still have mice as a backup. The li lizard, on the other hand, though, he only eats crickets. He's going to be in a bit of trouble there. So the efficiency of energy transfer, we um, are looking at the biomass of the pyramid, all the living stuff that we have. And typically, only 10% of the energy and biomass goes from one, from one level to the next level. Now, why is that? Well, you know, we can't eat absolutely everything, the bird beaks, cellulose, and plants, the teeth. So when you consume an organism, you can't consume it 100% most of the time. Um, you, those owl pellets were a great example of that. And so also the other part of it is that those organisms use a lot of that for their life and living. And so the biomass pyramid here, we're basing upon the, the actual mass. And so you'll notice here it's labeled with the kilograms. So 1,000 kilograms, 100 kilograms, 10 kilograms, 1 kilogram. Now what's that referring to? It's not that this lion eats the wolf and he only gets 1 kilogram of energy. It's the lion is only getting about 1 kilogram of our original uh, producer population because how much of that mass was incorporated into the rabbit and how much of that rabbit was incorporated into our primary carnivore which was incorporated into our top carnivore. And so those numbers are representing how much from the original. And typically we lose 90% of the original mass as we go from level to level. Energy pyramids, on the other hand, look at the amount of energy originating from sunlight. Again, we see about a 10% or a 10% passed on, a 90% loss as we go up through our levels. So if you're wondering earlier, why don't we have like uh, quintanary consumers, the fifth level, or uh, sexenary uh, consumers for the sixth level, it's because there just would not be enough energy or biomass to be able to support that top level, uh, incredibly top level consumer. So most ecosystems stop at level three or level four. That concludes part B. Hope I haven't royally confused you. Uh, we're moving on to C next.